Hello and welcome to Talking Sunday Readings. My name is Tim and I'm joined as always by Ann Carter and by Pastor Dick Stadler. And we're going to be talking about the readings uh, that you guys might be hearing in church across the country today or on uh, this coming Sunday. And those readings are going to be an Old Testament lesson from 2 Samuel chapter 11 verses 1 through 15. Uh, an epistle reading from Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 21. And the gospel will be from Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 56. A reading from 2 Samuel. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants, and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, Haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Um, and I'm just want to kicking it off, kick it off here with a couple of questions, um, <clears throat> starting with Second Samuel. Uh, it's the very famous story of David uh, seeing Bathsheba uh, bathing on her roof, and uh, he calls her to him, and uh, the drama ensues, let's say. Um, so in my translation, it specifies that everybody's off fighting, but David wasn't. He was hanging out at home. And I was wondering why wasn't David fighting with them? Why was he hanging out at home? Um, and it also says that it was a, late at night and David went up onto the roof and he, onto the roof of the palace and he looked down and he saw her. And I'm wondering if he could then, if he could spy on everybody from the roof of his palace. And was this a regular thing that he did? Um, oh. And uh, yeah, let's start with there. Let's just go with a couple questions before we get too, too in-depth. There's a lot of, in I've got a lot of questions about this one, but uh, let's start there. Why wasn't David fighting? And uh, why was he sp spying on his neighbors, let's say? Does anybody know, Dick? Why didn't David go to war? No, uh, what we do have though, in the text, I think is a critique because it says in the spring of the year, is the usual time when the kings go out to battle. And David didn't go out like he should have. Instead, he sends Joab, his commander. Um, and I think it's it's a critique of David, a very uh, subtle one. 
and that he should have been out there with his troops, but he wasn't, and he was in previous battles, he was out there leading the charge. Yeah. But for some reason, he was being negligent. Hmm. And uh, maybe he was just feeding his own uh, fleshly desires by hanging around at the house and being comfortable and safe and so forth. I don't know. But uh, th there's no indication as to the why it has to be implied or in, uh, uh, Draw your yeah, right. Okay. Interesting. Um, so yeah, the, the scene is painted that David is up on his roof looking down and he sees her. Was this just part of, is this part of life out there that you go out and you look out at, over your neighbors? Was this just the position of the, of his palace that he was able to spy on them? Um, and did he do this often? A lot of those questions I don't think we can answer either, but we do know that his house was magnificent. And so from his roof, he could look down. And a, a lot of the Israelites um, spent time on their roofs because that was where the wind could come blowing in. Hmm. And if their house was kind of uh, low uh, on the slope, um, uh, they their house would be blocked from any wind from neighbors. So uh the question is why would they have a bathing pool up on the top of Bathsheba's house mm -hmm. and if you remember who her husband was he was Uriah the Hittite and he was one of David's premier warriors he was a member of the what they called the the 30 and he was out there fighting for his king but he was a Hittite he was a non-Israelite uh, so he may have built a ritual bath when they found archaeologically a lot of ritual baths in homes uh in jerusalem uh, he may have built his own ritual bath so he could be a devout um jewish convert if he was a convert um and his wife uh could also stay ritually clean and apparently she was just finishing her period uh and later uh, evidence in the text says that uh, and that's why she will be ovulating. That's why she's uh, capable of uh, becoming pregnant. But the re Jewish law required that after a, a woman's period was over, she had to go through a ritual bath. Mm -hmm. And so some have suggested that that's what she's doing here on the roof. Others have suggested she was seducing uh, the king because she knew very well that she would be seen and that there is no modesty in what she was doing. So you'll have to decide, you know, which, which side you want to come down on. And there may be other explanations. Have you heard any others, Anne? Well, I've heard those. And I, I'm a staunch supporter that Bathsheba, because the text doesn't tell us, she wasn't out there trying to seduce anybody, um, that she was minding her own business. And what was David doing spying on her? Uh, but that's my own uh, basic interpretation that um, if she was devoted to her husband, um, then she would not have done that. Um, and David, but we don't know. It just doesn't tell us. She has been maligned throughout history um, as being yeah. a seductress, but there is no proof of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it just, uh, it, when the king summons you to his palace, you don't say no. Mm -hmm. So she's a vulnerable woman in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, or as some critics would say, uh, she was rewarded for her uh, strategy uh, and sh she accomplished what she wanted to and that is to have the uh, king do that. Yeah. Um, but, but, and I will counter that with, if the king, if David had not had, had um, acted within some sort of honor, he would have denied anything and nobody would have been able to do anything for her. Um, if the king didn't acknowledge that he had, was the father, she would have been stoned for adultery. So it was a very risky thing on her part, if indeed she was trying to get pregnant so the king was going to marry her and so that she could become part of the house, royal household. I think it's, that's a risky, it's a risky venture for any person, uh, especially uh, when there are specific laws against what she was, what she was purported well, to have doing. Yeah, and, and another piece in this is that, um, it doesn't say that he uh, invited her to uh, have an affair with him. He just invites her to the palace. And she may have innocently thought that, oh, my husband, one of his 30, one of his premier warriors, uh, maybe he's got a report on him for, for me. 
and maybe he's going to give me special information. Now, that's assuming that she was uh, innocent and naive and, and that she just went there. And then he, using his power, we know how people look position have taken advantage of women um takes advantage of her and she becomes pregnant mm -hmm. yep. um, another little twist to that is that um it isn't just her husband who is part of david's 30 it's also her father uh, she's yeah. the son she's the daughter of eliam i think i'm pronouncing that right yeah. and he was another listed in um let's see second samuel chapter 23 there's a listing of all of david's uh, mighty warriors and those two are listed and eliam's eliam's father is ahithophel who was david's counselor so there's a possibility that bathsheba knew david and thought she was going there because she knew david and david knew her family mm -hmm. and would have no qualms about no, who knows? Who knows? But yeah. David took an awfully big arrogant. Well, I'm going to take the the wife of my 30, who this guy risked his life for me. This guy went out there. He's out there battling in my place right now, and I'm going to I'm going to sleep with this wife. And then I, it's just the the hubris is is really unbelievable, almost. And isn't it interesting how many places? he had the opportunity to turn away from the temptation. I mean, uh, if you go through that catalog of detail, um, when he first saw her, he could have walked back into the palace and busied mm -hmm. himself with other things mm -hmm. that were what God wanted him to do. Um, even after she comes, he didn't have to seduce her uh, or invite her to have sex with him. And um, after he did have sex with her, he could have gone to Nathan the prophet and said, I did a terrible thing. Uh, I'm sorry. He doesn't take any opportunities that are there for him to repent. And this is kind of strange for a guy who's called a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. But what that picture is for us is that a man after God's own heart is still a sinner. And he's going to show his weaknesses. But what will make him a man after God's own heart is will he repent of his sin eventually? And unfortunately, we're not going to get that story this week. We're going to get it next mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. oh. That's right. That's right. Tim, we kind of took over. What no, other... that's okay. It was all good. Um, I do have a couple of other questions, though, if we if we can just uh, quickly, if we can hit a couple other things. Um, I'm wondering about Bathsheba. What do we know about her? Um, who was she? Because in this story, she, there's very little about her. She was bathing. She was beautiful. He called her. She went. She's, I'm, she's pregnant. And that's kind of it. Um, what do we know about her, aside from the fact that she was Eliam's daughter and Uriah's wife and what's her what what's her background was she a Hittite with Uriah was she a Jew do we know what do we know about her I we guess. just don't know we don't know oh, okay and what's interesting is that after this event she's never called Bathsheba she's called the wife of Uriah the Hittite oh really now, I don't know if that is a conscious effort on the part of the writers of scripture to not give her uh, an identity uh, if that's their judgmentalism or, or what the reason is for that. But she's never called Bathsheba, just the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And when the uh, David asks about her before he sends for her, mm -hmm. the courtiers or the people of his uh, palace come back and report to him, oh, she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now you wonder, are they warning him? This is a guy you don't want to, to insult because he's giving his life for you. They're giving him every opportunity to say no to this temptation. Mm -hmm. And then when she comes and goes back, you, you got to believe people in the palace knew that well, she everybody was. Knew. Everybody, everybody knew. Everybody knew. And so when Uriah comes back uh, and David tries to cover it up by encouraging him to go have sex with his wife and go down to the home and, and he refuses to. I wondered if maybe he was shrewder than we give him credit for. And he knows very well what's been happening because people talk. And so when he sleeps at the door of the palace with all the other people that are there, you better believe somebody may have said something. Uh, I can't prove that, but I, that's my suspicion. And so he says, I'm going to stick it in your face, David, after you insult me by having an affair with my wife, I'm not going to give you the easy way out. No way. And so he twice, uh, he's so resolute, even when David gets him drunk, he doesn't do it. And so um, I wondered if maybe 
he's more aware of what's going on here than uh, we sometimes assume. Mm -hmm. that makes I'll sense. add to that, that they not only identify her as the wife of Uriah, they say, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam. Mm -hmm. Not only, she's got two connections to you, David. Don't no. mess, what are you doing? What are you thinking about? Yeah, you know exactly. who she is now, back off. And he, he doesn't. doesn't. And obviously they can't give him any advice, don't do anything with her. That would be lethal. Uh, but they can put up this information that maybe they're hoping will uh, get him to be more rational, you know. Yeah. That. I mean, we I guess do we know this? Is this something that David has done before and this is just the first time he got caught? Or is this is I mean, it's only ever mentioned the one time that he saw her, saw somebody and took the chance. I mean, is this was this common? common thing for kings to do back in the day, just take whoever they wanted, whenever they wanted them? Well, we know they had multiple wives, they had concubines, and so um, it, it, it would be surprising um, if there were not other histories uh, connected with this. And as you read, the, I, I, I didn't review the whole life of David in preparation for this, but I wonder if there aren't other women who are mentioned by inference gotcha. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well he was only the second king and he okay. was creating this this kingdom that had not existed before so that i'm sure there were a lot of very grateful people to think that there might be peace yeah so you let somebody like that get away with a lot he was very um, charming i think he was enigmatic he was passionate very passionate man I'm sure he was very attractive um Michael, Saul's daughter, was hopelessly in love with him. Abigail married him for political gain, but I think she liked him too. He had at least seven wives by this point. So he's had multiple wives. And mm -hmm. so um, what is interesting is that when he finally decides to cover up because nothing works um, by having the husband killed so he can look like the monarch largesse, um, he... Um, gives a very specific order to Joab, his commander, put everybody out there in a vulnerable position. And when the fighting is really strong, pull everybody back except for Uriah. I mean, and Joab was a smart enough military commander to know that's stupid. Now that'd be too obvious. So what he does, he puts everybody at jeopardy and gets them too close to the wall of the city where the archers can, uh, attack them easily and he lets even some of the innocent soldiers uh, as well as uriah get slaughtered and then they send the message back to david oh got bad news um we got defeated and um david even gets upset about that report you know but then um in a show of largesse uh he says well but you know those things happen in war and what a phony you know what and um and he's glad that his strategy worked uh because they also say oh and by the way uriah the hittite um one of your 30 exemplary warriors was killed yeah mm -hmm. so it, it's a fascinating study of, of intrigue of deception yeah. and everything that we think would disqualify a guy from being a man after god's own heart Mm -hmm. And that's why it, it's a good challenge for us, because it helps us to dig back into what grace really is. It's unconditional love. It's undeserved love. It's love for those who have forfeited the right to be loved. And that's what God shows to David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, he doesn't let David get away with that. We'll find that out next time. Yeah. A little, little teaser for the next, mm -hmm. for next week. Mm -hmm. A reading from Ephesians. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, 
that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations for ever and ever. Amen. Yeah, let's move along to Ephesians, I think. Um, I don't really have much in terms of questions here. Um, I always just like to get a little more context about the epistle readings. What's what's going on or what was going on at the time that this uh, this was written, that this message needed to be needed to be heard, if anybody knows. Well, we get to hear a prayer of David for the Ephesian Christians. And what does he pray for? He doesn't pray for financial success or for personal monetary or physical blessings. He wants them to know the love of Christ because he knows how important that is for guilty sinners Mm -hmm. and to be filled with the fullness of God. Because when God is in you, then he's there also with his gospel when you become aware of your guilt. And he talks about the power at, at work within us Uh, is more than we can ask and he continually gives us all these blessings so it's quite a catalog in these few verses of the blessings that believers have by God's grace and he must have felt a need for the Ephesians to hear that maybe because they were being uh, attacked by others as not doing enough uh, or whatever the reason was Uh, I don't have a better context than that uh, except that um, the, the message is so full of gospel reminders and these the people can look for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If the purpose of the church as stated is that the church is to share God with the world, what better way to do that than remembering that to, to stay rooted in, in God and that God will help you. And that's what this is. Um, what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of God, um, it surpasses all knowledge. Don't, don't be complacent. Don't get scared. Keep your courage up. It's going to be hard, but keep at it. That's my and, summation. And, and I think there's a good reminder in here um, that it, there's nothing in here that says you should be known for being against everything that is idolatrous and pagan and everything in your culture that is wrong. Um, instead, he's hoping that they will be known for their love for the presence of God in their lives and for the positive. And I'm afraid sometimes the church has lost sight of that as part of their mission. And so they go into communities and they're known very well for everything they're against and all the things that they are condemning and all the things they are critiquing, but they're not known for what they're for, that they are for a savior, for a redeemer, and for one who gives all of us a chance to eternal life. Yeah. So it, it's a good reminder in a yeah. few short yeah. verses. It is. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, in the villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. So uh, Jesus has sent the disciples ahead of him. They're on the boat, and then Jesus comes out after them. 
I'm wondering why did Jesus send them ahead of him? And also, how did they think he was going to catch up with them? Because if they were in the boat, I mean, did Jesus have a second boat that he was going to take? Or was he going to walk around and meet them? The, the, the logistics of this kind of strike me as odd. Um, and also in my translation, it says that Jesus was about to pass them as he was walking on the water. I wonder, was he just going to keep on going if they hadn't cried out to him? Or was that just kind of a fluke in my translation? So I don't know if you guys have any insights about either of those details. I have always thought that Jesus was exhausted hmm. and he just wanted time alone, time to refresh. So somehow he slipped away and he made sure that his disciples got away so that everybody can separate from all of the throngs of people. That's just been mine. But I've always found that fascinating too. Where's he going? He's out there walking on the water and he's just going to pass them by. And it's just, does Jesus just have a sense of humor? I think he does. Um, but it's not apparent that, that he was doing that as a joke. Well, I think that's parallel to the Emmaus disciples when he pretends that he's going to go further and gives them an opportunity to invite him to stay with them uh, because it's late in the day. And maybe in this case, he's providing them with an opportunity as he's kind of walking by nonchalantly the for, them, the, yeah. for them to shriek out and, and cry out for him, you know, and so forth. Um, and so the, I think this is the same episode that we hear um, in other Gospels where Peter says, I'll get out and walk on the water. I think this is the same episode. Mark just doesn't tell us that part of the episode. And Jesus heals the storms and settles it. And so um, it's, it's an illustration to the disciples who are on the beginning of their learning curve to learn how to trust him. Uh, here's another reason, um, because he's the God of nature and he can calm the seas. And then they, they get over to Gennesaret where he does some more healing and does more proof that he is not just a man, but he's God, you know, but. Yeah, um, yeah. another thought I had is that when you, are in the middle of an, a really explosive situation and, and your, your, your emotions are high and you see something that you think isn't real. Later, you look at it and think, oh, well, that was an interesting experience. Well, here's, as you said, Dick, training, um, teaching them to recognize that what you think is impossible is real. You think nobody can walk on the water, but here I am call out to me and I will answer you and stuff is going to happen in your life now because I'm sending you places you never dreamed you'd go. Remember that I'm that what you think it might be impossible is actually a reality and and I will get in the boat with you and, and take you across the, the shore. That's and when they are terrified um, and we assume they shriek out, um, he doesn't say what a bunch of sissies. What kind of guys have I chosen? You know, I thought you guys are professional fishermen. You didn't uh, get upset by this storm. He says to them instead, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And he does that over and over with people, reminding them, okay, there can be a lot of things in life that are going to make you scared and afraid. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. But there will be things that will make you afraid. But don't be afraid. Look at me. Remember me in my presence. And, and that's a powerful lesson that comes through this, that his gracious treatment of his forgetful disciples. You know? And then when he gets to Gennesaret on the other side, um, as many people as touched him were made well, it, just the, the hem of his garment. And so um, there is power that's being illustrated in both of these uh, segments of the reading that show this is, they were signs, signs that the Messiah had come that the son of god was in there in their midst and so believe what he has to say yeah. mm -hmm. well, if there are no other closing thoughts um i will thank you all for joining us this week uh we do appreciate your your uh joining us um please yeah like and share the uh, subscribe um and uh share this with people you know and people you think might get something out of it we do appreciate you and uh we hope to see you again next week on talking sunday readings <laughs>